this point, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Jeff Bird, Sutter Hill Ventures, who will introduce tonight's program. Jeff. Thanks, everyone. Hey, what we'd like to do, I think, first is just to introduce uh, the panelists tonight, and then they can go back and sit down so that they can see Rob's presentation. Dr. Jackler will start first. But if I may just go through and, and make our introductions. Um, first, I'm Jeff Bird. I'm at Sutter Hill. I'm a healthcare venture capitalist and was a graduate of the MD-PhD program at Stanford. I'm pleased to be here with tonight's panelists who are all professors, full professors at Stanford University. So first to the, to the far right, uh, Rob Jackler, uh, Dr. Robert Jackler is professor and chair of the Department of Otolaryngology and also head and neck surgery at Stanford. Dr. Jackler was recruited to the department at Stanford in 2003. Prior to that time, he was a uh, faculty member at East University of California, San Francisco, where he was for 17 years. Uh, Dr. Jackler is the author of three books, uh, 25 textbook chapters, and more than 140 peer-reviewed papers. So it's uh, really our honor to have him here. He's a, a microsurgeon of the ear and other fine structures at the base of the skull as well. And uh, he has a keen interest in the human technical interface and technology interface. And tonight's uh, title is Man's Coming Interface to Technology, Central Role of the Human Ear. So. Um, we'll look forward to Rob's talk in just a moment. Uh, Stefan Heller, PhD, to, next to my right here, is a, also a professor in the department of OHNS, otolaryngology and head and neck surgery at Stanford. Dr. Heller was recruited to Stanford from Harvard in 2006 after describing the identification of stem cells in the inner ear that could potentially replenish the hair cells that are responsible for hearing. And he today leads a research effort within the Stanford Institute for to, to cure hearing loss, whose aim is to have clinical trials for new approaches to curing deafness within the next decade. And finally, um, to my left, Dr. Anthony Ricci, PhD, is a professor in the department at Stanford. Um, Dr. Ricci received his PhD at Tulane University, and he's an expert in studying the mechanical function of cells at the atomic level. And much of his research is also uh, focused on these hair cells that are the very rare receptors in the ear that are responsible for hearing. So there are only 15,000 of these cells that you're born with, and as we'll hear about, they have a very special role, and as we lose our hearing, we start to have damage to those rare and uh, important cells. Uh, additionally, uh, Tony studied the mechanisms of damage, for instance, uh, that occur with the use of certain antibiotics in hearing and he's made advances in and has ideas on the development of antibiotics that are safer as well. So if you'll just uh, join me in thanking everybody for joining, we'll start with Dr. Jackler. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm an ear doctor. It's the first thing I always ask. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Sally and, and especially Krishna as well and, and Tom and all of you for having our group here from Stanford today. Uh, we looked at the invitation, it said business casual. I'm a doctor, those two guys are scientists. They're in their business uniform. It's perfectly normal. Now, we're going to talk each, myself and Dr. Heller, for about 15 minutes, and then we hope to have a very interactive discussion with all of you about some of the issues that we're bringing up. And we're not only talking about interface technology between the human senses and digital devices. We're also talking about some emerging biotechnology, which is revolutionary in the field of hearing and overcoming. We thought you'd be interested in both, and we'll see. Now, I'm going to begin talking about the interface between the human body and, and digital technologies. If you think about what we started doing 30 years ago, putting computers on people's desks and distributed them, in the last 20 years, we've been linking them up within the enterprise and outside by the Internet. Huge advances have been in this area. But if you look at what we're doing in that last two feet between the person and the machine, it is still very primitive, and it's an area of great advancement, I think, in the future, and many great opportunities for innovation. Now, the fact that the ear may be a favored device for communication has been around a long time, and certainly it was well appreciated in the 1960s. But the point that I'm going to make tonight, the underlying premise, is that wearing an ear device will become a, a ubiquitous feature of modern life as a consumer electronic product, and it will be more common than wearing a wristwatch. Now, 
Let's talk a little bit about the general field of interface before we settle down on the ear. If you think about the way we input text into most of our computers, it is really very little change from the era of the Underwood and Smith Corona to today, other than in that day you ran out of ribbons, and with this device you run out of batteries, which is maddening. All right. Now, uh, a few years ago I talked with Terry Winograd, someone many of you may know, He's the white-haired guy with a bunch of folks that look like uh, high school students. Um, but, you know, I said to him, you know, typing is so slow. Even expert typers give very little information. And I've always remembered the answer that he gave me. He said, you know, think about when a pianist plays Mozart. Think about the information flow that comes in that situation. And he's right. The human hands potentially can convey great information. Now, you can imagine this sort of in the Wii, although I don't think we're going to be looking at a hand-based device that you can probably throw into your television screen. But probably, you will not be moving in predictable keyboard ways, but in some very eloquent and complicated hand motions that convey information and position. Now, of course, we all know that we're speaking to our computers, and this is really taking off in terms of text but also in terms of the ability to command uh, and, and, and ask our computers uh, to do things. Now, I'll point out, today, the repetitive stress in using a computer is the carpal tunnel syndrome. But what we're going to find soon as we give running text routinely to our computers, both instructions and dictations, is that we're going to be speaking to our family, to our coworkers, and our computer all day. And if you think about the human vocal cords, every time you're talking, they're knocking together like that. And that repetitive stress is going to become the human voice. So we have to develop interface tools that allow a very soft voice so you're not banging together and still to be understandable to the device. And that may well be a technological interface to the human larynx that enables something that is sustainable all day long in the different settings. Now let me focus in on the ear because I think the ear is going to be very high value real estate in the future. And to point out, first of all, that wearing an ear device traditionally has carried a great stigma. If you had a device on your ear, suddenly you're 10 years older and you lose 20 points of IQ. You're deaf and dumb, right? Now, I'll give you an example. I mean, think about it fundamentally. You take a piece of glass, metal or plastic, you stick it in front of your face. It fundamentally blocks your face and changes how you look. But somehow, culturally, we see that as looking stylish, or you're smart, you're intelligent if you wear glasses. You stick something in your ear, you're suddenly old and dumb. And no, it's true. And, 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 and it's actually more subtle and off to the side. And, and this is the traditional paradigm of the hearing aid user in the past. But I will tell you, if you go to University Avenue in Palo Alto and you see someone walking along, acting like they're talking to Jesus, they're probably on a cell phone. And they're probably young people. And today, a senior citizen may go to the senior center and go, hey, look what I got, you know? Look at this latest sound ID. All right. So I'll give you an example of how bad that bias has been. We have an operation called stapedectomy, where you can go in and there's a frozen hearing bone and you can replace it. And it has, it's great success, but it has a one in a hundred chance of utter deafness in the ear, no matter how good the surgeon is. LASIK, on the other hand, can get rid of your eyeglasses. Now I submit to you, if I were to say to you, I can get rid of your eyeglasses, but there's a one in a hundred chance of blindness in each eye I do, you tell me to totally stuff it. There's no way you do that. On the other hand, people routinely mm -hmm. submit to ear surgery to get away from wearing a hearing device or an ear device. My point is, this stigma is evaporating rapidly, and it's changing, and it has very important implications. So in the future, and really in the present, is that these devices connote style and youthfulness. They're elegant. They're beautiful. You have celebrities, David Beckham, the soccer player. You have Brad Pitt, digital gentleman and highly evolved human. <laughs> Whatever that is. Didn't he just have some ad of a perfume or something? Yeah. Maybe he devolves since this. I don't know. You know, you get bling, and there are jewelry-like things. People are proud. These are adornments. Even Jesus Christ wears it here. <laughs> okay? So, you know, once you've got these things on your ear, what are you going to do with them? Well, first of all, and it's obvious, it becomes your cell phone, right? And, and you can control it with voice systems in your car that can do this today. Cell phone, phone home. 
These are some early generation devices. <laughs> and of course it's and of course it's a computer interface device, needless to say, but you know what? It is also your earpod. This ear device can store all of your music, your audiobooks, but you know you walk into a museum. If you want, that picture will tell you about itself. You go to cross the road and there's a bus coming, it screams, stop, look right. It's a safety thing. And you can just let your imagination flow once this thing is tied in to knowledge and warning and interactions, not just classic telephony, not just classic what the iPod is today. There are many places to go with that. It obviously is an interface for GPS. You're driving down the street. You want to go to 1212 Pleasant Street. It certainly is going to be able to tell you that. Now, this is something which is profound, and that is instantaneous translation amongst languages. This is not something that's going to reside in the near future, simply in a near-level device. But imagine with Bluetooth or some faster successor of Bluetooth, architectural computers in this building, in your home, in a restaurant. You can speak to me in Japanese, and I can hear you in English. Oh, and by the way, if I want to select a nice Cockney British accent, or if I want to have a New Orleans accent, Tony, I can choose whatever I would like in that way. This is coming. It's an access to information. There's a web in your ear. So you're reaching 1212 Pleasant Street, and you say, device, 1212 Pleasant Street, John Jones, what's his wife's name? And in your ear comes Cynthia. It is also possible, once you have these devices on everyone's ear, as a routine consumer electronic device, to improve a human sense in the population at large. So that means, for example, if you want to program that thing so that you can hear a dog whistle, you can. It just has to shift the frequency down to alert you, right? If you want to be able to, you remember the comic books, you know, you listen to people 50 feet away, you know, across at the party? There are possibilities of doing things like that, not necessarily that you'd want to. But imagine in a sophisticated signal-to-noise ratio analysis and enhancement, you could sit in these incredibly noisy restaurants. This, this place is wonderful acoustics, isn't it? But you sit in a restaurant where you just can't understand or hear people. You can have this thing analyze the background din and selectively reduce it and augment the, the frequency distributions and cadence of human speech so that we're improving a human sense overall. Of course, they can be programmed to protect you against noise injury when the firecracker goes off or when you walk by a jackhammer. And of course, right now, if you look at the hearing loss world, about a third of the people who need a hearing aid wear it. That's the nature of that stigma that's going away. But once these things are in everyone's ear, it's a simple matter to simply program them to accommodate for hearing loss. Now, just to give you an idea where these things can go, once you have a telemetry device on the human body full time, why not have a health monitor? You're going to be like the 1970s Apollo astronauts, completely wired up. This thing can easily measure glucose. It can measure oxygen, CO2. You can have a little sender on the chest sending e EKG up to this device and outward. Um, you can monitor many different physiologic functions, not just sporadically, but in an ongoing way and record it over time so that when you see your physician, not only will they have your genome, not only will they have your proteome, They'll also have your normal physiologic function throughout the days. So you worry about hypertension, for example. You know, that's a very cyclical variable thing. They're going to be able to do a, a statistical analysis of how that changes over time. Now let's talk about the design and implementation of the interface. And certainly everyone wants to make it subtle, not the least of it to these guys, because wearing one of those things says simply what? Shoot me first. <laughs> so modern hearing aids have come a long way. They're, they can be very subtle in this way, presented at the entry of the ear. But I would submit to you, presenting a sound at the entry of the ear in many situations isn't the best way to do it. And the gradual tendency is for those devices to move further down in the ear, and even at some point in the future be entirely implanted. Now, there are issues about implanting the microphone. One can actually, with the piezo-ceramic, turn the eardrum into a microphone interestingly enough. But I think the fully implanted devices, while there are some out there today in development, are not likely to take over. I want to uh, mention Rod Perkins. Many of you know, we're kind enough that Rod came today. Um, Rod, I think, has a fabulous new technology. It's not yet out the market, but it's really getting to the concept of an extended wear contact lens for the eardrum. That is to say, it's a device that fits on the eardrum here, and it is a photovoltaic. And that photovoltaic is powered by a laser 
that shoots down and not only powers the nanotech motor that drives the first bone of hearing, the malleus, but it also conveys the signal. Sound enters the open ear canal naturally, having all the resonances from the outer ear, and is picked up by the microphone, generating a current which travels to the processor. The DSP processes the signal, translating it into light pulses, which travel down the fiber optic probe. The light emitted from the probe is captured by the photoreceptor, creating a small current which drives the micromotor to vibrate the eardrum, causing sound to be perceived. So these types of devices at some time will be very commonly worn not only by hearing loss patients, and they will, this is a wonderful new technology, just, just paradigm changing. And I'll tell you right away, for those who've ever looked at the hearing aid market, it is ridiculously expensive. Thirty dollars worth of equipment is charged two or three thousand dollars, and this is right. There are, I actually have a, a kid that just came through biodesign at Stanford who's working on a hearing aid based on an iPhone. This is a lot of poor people that can't afford six thousand dollars for two hearing aids that way. Now let me shift over from technology to biotechnology, and I'm only going to be the introduction for my colleague Stefan Heller, but I want to tell you about the biological basis of the hope that we'll be curing hearing loss in the coming years. Now, to be able to uh, really understand this, we have to start understanding how the ear works. Is that sound or vibra is vibrations in air, it strikes the eardrum, is carried through a cantilevered series of three bones to the cochlea, which is the actual place where the vibrations are converted to nerve impulses and thence into the brain and upward. So let's just take a close look inside the cochlea, which means snail, and within the cochlea, you have two and three quarter turns there's a membrane that vibrates, and on that membrane is the organ called the organ of corti, which is really the business end of the ear. Here's a beautiful illustration by an artist we work with at Stanford showing the hair cells that Stefan is going to talk about. These are the cells, they're apices here, that when they bend, they actually fire. They're like a little variable potentiometer for the engineers in the room, and they shoot the signals up. Um, within the cochlea, All of these different areas, think of this like a piano keyboard. There's a place-pitch relationship. So this group of nerves versus this group of nerves have a different pitch. And after the hair cells have bent, they send a signal through the first order neurons down the hearing nerve, along the nerve towards the brain, and without getting into much detail, they go up through the brain stem to the cortex, and thence are integrated into knowledge, wisdom, hearing, and even with vision and other senses. Now, from the medical point of view, there are basically two kinds of hearing loss. There are hearing loss that has to do with the ear canal, ear drum, and hearing bones, and we can usually cure that today with advances over the last 50 years in microsurgery. Then there's the inner ear, which we are essentially nowhere with. There's almost nothing today, but we are on the cusp of a revolution that is going to solve that. And I think we're going to be curing all forms of inner ear hearing loss in the coming years. To give you an idea, um, this is an example of the middle of the two bones are missing, and we've reconnected it with a piece of ceramic. Here, all three hearing bones are missing, and there's a, a piece of titanium that is connecting up that can restore hearing. This is today's technology. If you have a hole in the eardrum, we simply move it aside, take a piece of your own tissue, and repair it. 96, 98% success rate in fixing holes in the eardrum. We've conquered what's called conductive loss. But when you've lost your hair cells, when they've died back due to blast injury, due to aging, everyone in this room has some hearing loss in the high frequencies, at very least, over time. Whether it be medications or illness that affects, those hair cells die back. But the important thing to realize is the nerve does not. There's Almost no one has nerve deafness, except Eduardo in my practice, of course. But almost no one does. The nerves are still alive. And, and because the nerves are still alive, this scar, this substrate, is what you're going to hear about from Dr. Heller. The concept of rebuilding an organ of cordy, putting hair cells back here, and thereby restoring hearing, and linking it together with the nerve fibers that still exist. Now, there is a device today, which is extraordinary, called the cochlear implant. This is a multi-channel electronic stimulator that stimulates the auditory nerve, taking advantage of little bipolar electrodes that stimulate individual frequency domains of the hearing system. 
This will take a child or adult who's utterly deaf and bring them back to hard of hearing. But that is not our goal today. Our goal is to bring to much better hearing than that, and of course not require uh, such a surgical procedure. Now, um, what we're talking about is the goal of restoring hair cells with a variety of different means, and I'll leave Stefan to tell you, but we're largely looking today, very likely, at a variety of different um, systems using induced pluripotential cells or using chemicals that switch on, um, uh, that switch on uh, master regulatory genes um, or turn on the proteins necessary for hearing uh, that are missed. So what we have is, at Stanford, we have the world's leading group uh, regenerating hearing and that we're trying a number of different lanes and a number of different methods. And based upon where we are today with advances in regenerative science as applied to the ear, we're very optimistic that a great deal of change is going to happen. So I'm talking to a group of business people in technology. What's the market? The market is enormous. Something like 36 million Americans have hearing loss, and probably many, many hundreds of millions in the developed world. Two or three of every child are born deaf. Now, why is the ear a target that might work for stem cells of regeneration? You think about solid organs in the body. If you've lost your liver, all you have is a scarred little nodule. You have no architecture. If you've gone deaf, you still have the elegant cochlear spiral. You still have the basal membrane. You still have um, all of the nerves. So that it's not that it's trivial. It's not. It is challenging. But you have a much greater possibility of doing something based upon that. Now, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge, really, the team of folks. Uh, you like that picture, Stefan? Uh, <laughs> Stefan is a, is a wonderful scientist, uh, as is Tony Ritchie, who will be joining. These people are eminent. Um, they are extraordinary in their field, in their creativity. This is also uh, the place around the world where people come to learn about these techniques and to further these techniques. And with that, I think I'll step aside and uh, can say, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, ha thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Sally, for for uh, having us here. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and, and I've been here before once, and, and this is actually a quite fascinating group coming out of the dungeon of science and and, um, <laughs> and talking to people who are really really smart and, and um, understand understand a lot of things that, that that how you bring things to the market and and how science translates into the real world and, and I think it will, it's exciting to, to be here and exciting to talk to you guys. I'd like to introduce uh, hair cells. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a trained uh, geneticist originally from Germany and I, I, I uh, came to the hair cell field because it was fascinating. It was like the Wild West. It's a, it's, a, it's a land of opportunity because we don't know a lot of things about hair cells and we don't know a lot of things about how hearing works but in order to repair it and to find cures for hearing loss. We need to understand how hearing works. That's why Tony is very, very important. Uh, he's he's, he's the, the world's leading scientist in, uh, in hair cell biophysics. And um, we, we draw a lot from this knowledge. And, and this is just, this is a picture of a hair cell. Um, and it, it shows you that it's a mechanical sensor. When you tip the tip of hair cells, this apical end, you can see that the cells, the cells are responding. They're extremely sensitive to uh, extremely sensitive motion detectors, and this helps them to integrate sound information, which is a traveling wave along the cochlear basal membrane, that is then transduced in a nerve signal and then conveyed to the nervous system via nerve cells. Um, why do we know so little? Uh, it's sort of embarrassing uh, compared to other fields, but there's a simple comparison. Looking at, um, this is a flat preparation of a mouse retina. Um, there are about 140 to 150 million photoreceptor cells in this retina. We completely understand how photoreception, how conversion of light works in the retina. In the inner ear, we have about 30,000 to 50,000 hair cells per inner ear. In the cochlear, it's about 15,000 hair cells. There are other hair cells that are distributed throughout our vestibular system. In reality, we can only get to about 5,000 cells. If we're really good in dissecting these little tiny organs, um, it takes quite a bit of practice to get to this point, but you get only about 5,000 cells. So comparing this with one retina, 
you need about 30,000 inner years just to get the amount of cells that you would get from a sim simple retina. People in the retina research field go to the slaughterhouse and get eyeballs from, 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 uh, from bovines. Uh, they, they can do a lot of biochemistry and genetics on these cells. We, we have a really hard time getting to those. That is part of the inspiration that I felt uh, for, for my work. Another comparison. Uh, New York City has about 8 million people. If these would be the number of neurons in your brain, then the amount of hair cells you have in your head would correspond to a single person walking down uh, somewhere in 42nd Street. So how do we lose hair cells? This seems to be the major problem that we are all having. Um, these are some of the environmental factors or hereditary causes that led to the loss of hair cells. The high frequency cells are more sensitive. We have some ideas why that is the case. Um, and they go first. So a lot of us have high frequency hearing loss. You, you can download an application for your iPhone that has a dog whistle on it and you just crank it up over 12,000 hertz. Uh, a lot of the males over 45 will not be able to hear this anymore. Um, for, for, for some reason, my wife, same age, can hear it. Um, women are not degenerating as fast mm -hmm. as we men do. Rob explained to you how, um, how hearing loss affects you. This is how it happens. There are two types of hearing loss. There, there are two types of hair cells in the inner ear. There are the so-called outer hair cells and the so-called inner hair cells. And you see from this wiring diagram, it's a simple wiring diagram, the auditory nerve mainly goes to the blue cell, the inner hair cell. Uh, the outer hair cells fulfill a different function. They are little amplifiers for, for sound. Without outer hair cells, your amplification is gone. And your vibrations of, your, of the basement membrane uh, is smaller. The inner hair cells work, still work. And in this case, the auditory nerve still works. And with a hearing aid, you can, you're able to convey the information to the ear. But as lots of people who wear hearing aids know, hearing aids are not perfect and they're extremely expensive. So it would actually be nice to find ways to restore these outer hair cells somehow differently than with, with a device. The inner hair cells, once they are gone, there's no transduction at all. The auditory nerve is still there, but it's silent because it's not being stimulated. And this is where a cochlear implant comes in. A cochlear implant can still stimulate the auditory nerve, although there are only a few electrodes that could, would represent the whole dynamic range of hearing. Therefore, it's very difficult for a profoundly deaf person to completely restore the hearing to the point where that person is able to, for example, have a phone conversation. It requires a lot of training. Um, I don't think that a lot of cochlear implant people can enjoy music anymore. It's really a completely different kind of hearing that you have with that prosthesis. Silence, for me, sometimes is beautiful. I like to go to the desert and just sit there, read a book, and, 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 and it's enjoyable. But for people who are deaf, silence is not enjoyable. It's, uh, it leads to uh, uh, being outcasted from society. It brings a lot of problems. Uh, people get depressed. Uh, and uh, it's not per se life-threatening, but it really reduces the quality of life that you have. There are about 30, 350 million people or probably more, the latest uh, WHO estimates go up to the 500 million mark. Um, there are many, many people in the third world that uh, lose their hearing uh, because a lot of drugs that are widely used are toxic to our hair cells. Aminoglycoside drugs, which are, which are used for um, which are cheap antibiotics, they are used in the third world all over the place. They cause hearing loss. And this adds to the number of patients that lose their hearing uh, every day. Uh, so, so this market is very likely to, co to, to increase uh, uh, much more. Tony Ritchie works on a novel antibiotic that, uh, that is not threatening our hair cells. And then I think he may be able to talk uh, more to us about this um, and, 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 and it, its implications and also the difficulties bringing this to the market. Uh, Dr. Jacqueline mentioned the Stanford Initiative to, to, to Cure Hearing Loss, um, which is, um, in, in my mind, this is what we need to do. It's sort of the Manhattan Project of, of attacking the problem. The, uh, 
it's, it's impossible for a single lab like my lab. My lab focuses on stem cells and on, on, on developing cell-based technology, and I will show you a tidbit of this in a second. Uh, but we cannot do this alone. We need uh, other researchers, and we are now about six researchers, uh, uh, three clinician scientists and three basic scientists at Stanford. We are still building the program. Um, that focus on multiple approaches to the problem. We focus on stem cell therapy, on gene therapy, molecular therapies, and on uh, developing novel devices and developing novel approaches to hearing. So there, there is sort of a timeline where we start pretty much now. Um, and the, at the end, the goal is to treat patients. Uh, I'm not a, uh, I, I cannot predict the future, so I cannot tell you when this will happen. A lot of patients always <coughs> Uh, ask me a question whether when will be a treatment that you're talking about now will when will this be available for patients it's di it's so difficult to predict you, you all know how difficult it is to bring anything to the market um, in the healthcare industry this is the same and in an, in an industry that has no precedent it is even more complicated on the other hand we are very optimistic about this we also think more out of the box. They're, 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 they're. John Ogilai is a researcher, uh, a clinician scientist in our group, um, who develops a novel devices which uses near-infrared spectroscopy, which is already in clinical trials, to uh, investigate signals that arrive in the auditory cortex and in the auditory system uh, in uh, cochlear implant patients. These patients you cannot uh, put into an MRI, M MRI uh, machine because of their implantation. So you need to be able to do something that is similar to an MRI. And this technology uh, is able uh, to, to, um, to visualize um, uh, uh, brain function close to, uh, with, 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 a, with, a, with a resolution that is close to an MRI system. Um, Rob mentioned advanced genetics. I, I think this is going to be the future in a few years from now, every patient will have his or her genome sequenced when they enter a clinic. And this information will be uh, compiled together with healthcare data and with research data so that at some point we will be able to predict when a child is born whether this child has a susceptibility to certain drugs that could affect its hearing or whether this child has a susceptibility to loud noises uh, whether it should avoid uh, being exposed to a, a fire truck driving along the street, which for most of us is not threatening our hearing, but for people who are susceptible, this could cause a serious problem, particularly if it happens over and over again. <clears throat> we have to find out how to get, get drugs, compounds, viruses, gene therapy devices, or cells inside the ear. It's not so simple to, uh, as with other organs. The, the liver is great, you can just inject it. The inner ear, when you uh, drill a hole, you very likely cause more damage than you do good. So we need to find ways to very smoothly and very carefully bring, uh, uh, bring compounds into the ear. And then Tony, again, is, is leading some research where, um, where instead of using a drill, he, uh, he, he develops a system where you can actually use enzymes to slowly shave away the bone to have a really tiny opening to actually access the ear. We all need this. If we ever find stem cells that would be able to regenerate hearing, we need to bring them <coughs> inside. Surgical simulation, you cannot, you cannot train someone on the patient with, with these, in this kind of technology. So you need to simulate and to train because these, these operations are really, really um, uh, complicated and surgeons need to be trained in that. Um, Dr. Jackler meant, mentioned interface technologies, and this is where my, what my laboratory works on. We, we work on cell-based technology, uh, and I mentioned the crux of dealing with inner ear cells. We cannot do research on uh, a lot of these cells, so the main motivation for me as a scientist, not even thinking about a medical application initially was, well, I, I need to do experiments on hair cells, and in order to get enough hair cells, I need to bring 50 mice into the lab, and I, I don't want, I, I love animals, I, I don't want to kill so many animals, so I thought there must be a way of getting hair cells or inner ear cells from uh, a renewable source, namely embryonic stem cells. So we developed um, a method a couple of years ago to generating these cells from embryonic stem cells. Um, although this method is 
very tricky and it's not very efficient. But we are now in version two of our protocol. We are, we are working hard on a version three, which very likely will be more efficient than the previous version. And then the reason for the year is always a difficulty to deal with. The reason for this is um, these blue balls represent cells. When they start out as an embryonic cell, a cell that is what we call pluripotent, it can give rise to any cell in the body. Some cell types in the body are much more preferred than other cell types. For example, generating neurons from embryonic stem cells is rather simple. That's why trials with neuronal cells are entering the clinic right now. You can also generate epidermal cells or muscle cells relatively easily. But getting the cells to become otic is sort of um, uh, walking on this mountain ridge and the cells always tend to become something else. It's like dealing with little kids or with dogs. That <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so this is a major challenge for us. Uh, but, but I'm very confident that we will solve this in the, in the, in the upcoming years. Um, so what happens when we solve it? We can, we can think about cell-based assays. If you think about stem cells, you always think about you get a transplantation. I want to tell you that this is maybe not the way uh, we, we, we will be using stem cells. So I will introduce cell-based assays. From stem cells, we can generate cells that are precursor cells of inner ear cells, hair cells, and their surrounding supporting cells. And this is what we have achieved. Um, Dr. Oshima, who's sitting there, uh, uh, one of his major findings published in 2010 was the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the protocol that, that, that we can use embryonic stem cells to generate these kind of cells. And uh, Dr. Ritchie was so kind to actually test whether these cells are mechanosensitive, like the initial slide that I showed. And we were able to show that these cells are indeed functional. They're not perfectly organized, and we are not getting a lot of them. So we are working on better ways to do that. So um, efficiency is a major problem, a roadblock. Tumorogenicity is another roadblock. These cells need to be pure. So we are working on purifying these cells. Um, so we are somewhere along this timeline. We don't know where we are going to be when these problems are solved. Uh, we think in the upcoming years. And the sooner we solve them, the sooner we are at the end. Um, so what are we doing? I, I know. <laughs> you guys are. <laughs> I cannot tell you anything. Huh? <laughs> Very good. So some things we are thinking of, um, and um, now talking to business people, the technology that we have is, is, uh, is, is licensed to a biotechnology company in San Diego, and they are thinking about assays like this. So one assay we are currently exploring is testing ototoxicity. So you can test existing drugs that are out on the market and see whether they are damaging your hearing. And in fact, there are some studies that show what, uh, when you take the 1,200 leading uh, drugs that are FDA approved, that are used by many, many patients, if you do studies like this, um, uh, in, in a recent study, about 20 drugs were identified that cause hair cell death. And it really depends on the susceptibility of the person and on the dose. So if you take too much of a certain drug, you can lose your hearing over time. And we don't know exactly which drugs are out there that cause this. If you know what's ototoxic, you can actually find other drugs that protect it. So finding drugs that protect our hearing are equally important than identifying the bad ones that, that, uh, that cause hearing loss. And of course, this is the holy grail, to find drugs that lead to regeneration. And this is something we haven't told you yet. The hair cells, once they die, they do not regenerate spontaneously. You get the scar tissue, but they are organisms, and, and about 99% of all animals on this world are able to regenerate their hair cells. Only a small number of animals, namely the mammals, us, and other non-egg laying vertebrates are losing their hair cells and once they are gone they cannot regenerate. So finding ways to bring them back and learning from how for example chickens or birds or, or fish are regenerating their hair cells is really important in this process. Or using artificial sensory epithelium and using a large library from a pharmaceutical company name one of the big ones, and throwing it on these assays and finding drugs that lead to this regeneration in vitro 
and then moving forward to an in investigation on new drug and so forth. So using these high throughput, high content screens, current roadblocks are efficiency and particularly expansion and banking of the progenitor cells to have actually many, many of the cells. And finally, one thing that Dr. Jacqueline mentioned is uh, using patient-derived cells, iPS cells. The, the, the Nobel Prize for Medicine was given to um, Dr. Yamanaka and, and a colleague. Uh, Dr. Yamanaka developed a method, he's from Kyoto, Japan, um, to introduce uh, four reprogramming factors to turn any cell of your body into a cell that is equivalent to an embryonic stem cell. And we are now developing this protocol or have implemented the protocol in our laboratory so we can take cells from a hearing loss patient and take a skin biopsy or even a blood cell and turn the cell into an embryonic stem cell. And then we move forward and generate inner ear cells from this patient and we can uh, analyze the, the, the disease causing mechanisms directly in a culture dish. This is, this is very helpful because you can use patient derived uh, tissue that you would have no access to. You cannot just drill a hole in the ear and take a biopsy. It's, it's, it's impossible. You, you now, we now have for the first time a substrate where we can start developing uh, novel treatments. And I think this is extremely powerful. We also uh, combine this method with something that, that, that is called a whole genome-wide association study where once the genome of every patient is being sequenced and known and put into big computers that, that, that uh, that, that keep track of the information and associate this information with um, data on susceptibility, namely whether a certain drug is causing is, is more efficient in causing hair cell loss from one patient group compared to another patient group. Uh, this information will be extremely important for predictions, whether a, uh, a certain person is able to hear up until old ages or whether a person really has a is going to develop a problem and it will and we will be able to tell what kind of drug or what kind of environment that person should avoid moving through their life so that they are not turning deaf and with that i would like to stop and turn it over to jack try to take questions if there are some um otherwise we'll be come up with some topics I'm sure but does anyone have a question for any of the panelists that they'd like to ask this may be a little self-serving because I have this and it's tinnitus mm -hmm. and uh, you never mentioned tinnitus what causes it and is that part I, it's not really a hearing loss per se but it's a constant ringing of the ears and is, is your research aimed at that as well I'm going to handle that so Actually, tinnitus and hearing loss are flip sides of the same coin. So when a segment of hair cells are missing, say in the very high frequency areas, the nerve fibers that go to them become irritable, and they begin to discharge rhythmically, even though no sound is, is stimulating them. Because those nerves are hardwired into the hearing part of the brain, you hear ee. Older people, most of us, have this. I have ringing all the time in a quiet room. Most of us, it doesn't bother some people. It bothers to some degree. There are some interesting thoughts, and, and, and it doesn't relate directly, although if we regenerate hair cells and we're able to replace the lost hair cells and satisfy what is causing rhythmic discharge in the nerve and bring it back from a, a random stochastic pattern back to a meaningful pattern, it will help. I will tell you there's a very interesting point that the hearing nerve itself is never silent. Even in the most silent place, the hearing nerve is constantly active in a way. What that tells you is that there is a sort of pseudo-random code that the, of, of nerve discharge pattern that the brain reads as silence, right? So if we can take on your regular rhythm and superimpose on it this sort of stochastic code that the brain knows, if we can sort that out, we can restore and trick the brain into thinking it's silence. This is some of the approaches people are looking at. Bottom line, though, we don't have a cure. There are things we can do to help, but not. But that's what may come out of this. Can you speak to uh, the response of the deaf community to things like the cochlear implant? To, in particular, uh, some members of the deaf community think that you shouldn't cure uh, yeah. hearing. Right. I, I, 
I think there, there, there is a deaf community that, that has evolved their own language and their own, their own uh, um, um, society. And they are uh, people within this community who are completely, they, they don't see themselves as being disabled. They, they, they don't want to be cured because they don't feel that they have any kind of disease. I think these people are, uh, they, they live their life the way they want to live their life. But I think the, the vast majority of people with hearing loss wouldn't agree with that. It's also, uh, 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 from my point of view, I, I think as a parent, it, it's, it's ethically a very interesting society. Because if, you're, if you have a child born into this society, the child cannot choose. It's the parent who dictate how this child will grow up. And I think, I think that's unfortunate. I, but I... Uh, uh, but I, I must say, from my point of view, being doing research toward a cure, I have not rarely, over the last 10 years, have maybe had one or two interactions with people from the deaf community. I have daily interactions, <coughs> emails from people who uh, want this research to go forward. Let me just comment, because that's a very interesting area. Shared language is good. <coughs> and if your child can't speak your language, it, sign language. Um, then you've lost the child to your culture and your friends and, and the people that are around you. However, working against that is the fact that the vast majority of children, and this is congenitally deaf, because if any of us went deaf today, we would continue to speak. We'd learn language, oral language. We'd learn lip reading. We would use various devices that could help, including the cochlear implant. However, most children born deaf today are mainstream. They get a cochlear implant. They go to regular schools. Schools for the deaf that teach sign language and manual communication are just way, way down. So that whole population is closing. Most deaf parents that met at Gallaudet or someplace have deafness for different genetic reasons. So their offspring, unless they had an autosomal dominant, mostly they're recessive. They're children here. And that's it's the children of deaf community, deaf parents that are really a challenge. But that era back in the 80s where the sign language message for cochlear implant was a gun. And, and that there were radical people in the deaf community that said, if you, as a hearing parent, had a deaf child, that child belongs to us now, not you. And that's way past. And I think the paradigm has shifted. Uh, people um, would, you know, especially older people. I mean, we're all hoping to live to a ripe old age and be very active and very communicative and very active. And we don't want to accept disability. And hearing loss is a huge isolator as you get older. Your world gets smaller when you can't enjoy a restaurant, when you can't enjoy Thanksgiving dinner, when you can't go to live theater. And, and you know, in the biggest thing, yes, it's the compelling story of the young child is born there. But there's a huge population of all of us who leave, lose these capacities as time goes by to help. Thank you. In front. Would you like more Hi, my name is Donna Kawasaki. And I'm in development of a technology that will be added to shoes um, that will engage the spine. Um, and there is a high correlation to the ear. And I would be very much interested to learn from you if there has been any research that is done in that area. Um, most of what I heard here was primarily um, in this geographic area. Um, to give you an idea, I've worked with 200 pairs of shoes um, and ice skaters actually that when you go from a shoe to an ice skate you engage the spine and have helped people for example with ringing of the ear um, people that have evolved from shoes to bare feet um, and engaging certain muscles in the feet um, but you are a doctor and I'm an mba -er. <laughs> and so um, and I got into this because I had a daughter that had it and um, had spine surgery myself, but I would be very much interested to learn. So, I haven't had that question since yesterday. <laughs> so, that's a really interesting, so remember that otolaryngology is popularly known as e ENT, which for this purpose will be your nose and toes, if you <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. So, so I think this gets down to gating, right? So it's been said, um, if, to give you an example, it's been said if you have tinnitus, right, hyperactivity of the nervous system that's intruding on your consciousness and, and, and disturbing you and giving you anxiety or depression, that if you wore a pair of shoes one size too tight and you created a countervailing stimulus, 
that you would not pay attention to the other obnoxious stimulus. So it's sort of a gating thing. It's like why the dentist pinches your cheek when they give the injection. So this is interesting. If you go to chiropractors, they will tell you that the nerves in the spine are intimately involved in the ear. If you go to people who study hearing sciences, they tell you they're totally separate anatomically <laughs> and physiologically. Um, but an acupuncturist would tell you that, that maybe there are ways to relieve it. So uh, I don't know if my colleagues, uh, Tony, do you have any wisdom about that one? <laughs> well, we know uh, elephants communicate through their feet, so. Right. Uh, uh, so explain that. Yeah. Well, that's possible. We have a uh, point, I don't remember the name. Faculty who uh, uh, Caitlin, Caitlin, who, study, who actually studies um, communication in elephant herds, uh, and the main form of communication is actually through vibration sensors that are that are in the feet, uh, and it's remar remarkable in images and movies that they have because they actually go to Africa a couple of months every year, which isn't a bad gig, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they have that by this watering hole, they've actually laid out uh, both vibration sensors and speakers. So they can now play back um, the vibrations to the elephants that say there's a predator, and you can watch the whole bird turn and, and protect the young and circle and move. Or, you know, now it's time to drink, and they can basically have the elephants kind of synchronized dancing of elephants. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's infrasound, right? It's very low so frequency. Low, it is low frequency. Yeah. I do think, in terms of tinnitus, to me it's not that surprising, just for the reasons that Rob said, because there's a lot of central compensation and processing uh, and hyperactivity that happens uh, mostly kind of in the thalamus, uh, where tinnitus uh, seems to be lying, because there's a feedback circuit there between the cortex and the thalamus that's regulated by the spontaneous activity in the nerve fiber, which is goes really low uh, when there's damage at the cochlear level. And so uh, there's also uh, feedback um, from the cerebellum as well there. And so uh, proprioception would, I think, be a, a natural way to kind of reinforce that inhibitory pathway and kind of calm down the thinness side of it. I'm kind of making that up a bit, but I can see it, that that's possible. I have a question following up with what he's talking about. Regarding the actual process of absorbing sound waves, how much uh, percentage-wise is coming in through the ear versus through the cranium, through the upper body? Uh, I would assume that the eardrum is sensitive to other elements that are conducting sound. Uh, yeah, so if you think the inner ear is filled with fluid and sound is propagated through air. So when you have an air to fluid interface, you have to have an impedance matching system. And that's why the eardrum is a big place and the bottom of the stapes is a small place. A sort of a 33 to one ratio gathers in a lot. And it's a pumping like a piston into a fluid filled inner ear compartment gathering. You can certainly very efficiently do bone conduction, right? Um, when you hum, when you tap your teeth together, in many different ways you can. It doesn't sound quite the same way that conducted through the ear, um, but it's quite an interesting thing. If you have ever had a speaker system that feeds back to you like a 30th of a second later, your own voice, it drives you crazy. You can't keep talking, right? It throws you way off. Or, and, and it turns out we have a very um, interesting system because you're constantly, your own speech is going to your ear. And there's a suppressive system that actually every time you speak tightens up the hearing bones and eardrum to try to hold that vibration out of the inner ear so that you're not constantly um, disturbing yourself as you speak. And in some people that breaks apart. And these folks literally can hear everything they say rattling around and it's highly disturbing. Which means that when you're speaking with someone and somebody else is, is saying something, maybe interrupting, that you really are not perceiving what they're saying because your system is shutting down input. That's called marriage. <laughs> so it, it seems like this hair breed, a regrowth, as a businessman, may have a better opportunity, business opportunity, for ma male baldness. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at that at all? Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> I haven't had that one in a week. <laughs> the question is about stem cells for hair growth. Right, yeah. right. I mean, the the, uh, the origins of the ear and the origins of the skin are actually, they're related, but they diverge very early in development. So the ear, uh, the cells 
that are, have hairs or hair cells and the cells that are on your head that grow hair are fundamentally different. So find, and actually what is interesting, the stem cells in the, in the skin that actually lead to hair regeneration have been identified by Lane Fuchs at, at the Rockefeller University. And then there, there's quite a business now evolving around that. And then uh, as a businessman, if you have money to invest right now, <laughs> I would be, I would split it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not very diplomatic. <laughs> so I have kind of a tech question. Um, you basically have three solution potentials here. You have transplant, you have IPS, or you have gene therapy. Each has their own problems, right? So you have either an architecture environment engagement problem, or you have an insertional mutagenesis problem, or you have sort of a, an epigenetic memory problem. So could you maybe talk a little bit about how you guys are making that decision and where you're hedging your bets? Right. I, I think it's it, it's simple. I think we, we are, it's like a racehorse kind of scenario right now. We are not putting anything on one on one horse right now. We, we, we try to get labs involved in our in what we are doing that are betting on every single technology that is out there because it's so difficult to predict. Also, if you think about uh, t trying to regenerate hair cells from a person, uh, who has a mutation. There's a, there's a gene called Connexin 26. Uh, it accounts for uh, about 50% of all hearing losses in, 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 the, in the general population that is out there uh, that is hereditary. So there's one gene that causes 50% of, of all the hereditary hearing loss mutations. So this is the gene w that you would like to address with gene therapy. But you need first, you need to restore the hair cells. So you need to get the IPS cells from the patient, you need to repair the gene and bring, it, bring these cells back into the patient. So you need to have already two technologies that you need to develop side by side <coughs> to do that kind of repair. So we cannot neglect any of the, of the, of the paths that, that are potentially possible. We need to develop them all. And then at some point, there will be a low-hanging fruit. So I think, uh, Finding a, a general solution for everything uh, in one step is not possible. I think we will have a long, low hanging fruit first, and we will have a, a certain clinical trial going on, for hopefully within a decade, that, that addresses one form of hearing loss very precisely, very efficiently. Um, and this kind of treatment will very likely not apply to another form of hearing loss. But you need to do a first step. and then. Neglecting a technology will, will be will be bad at this at this moment in time. I just want to ask you a, a, a basic question: Is it possible for hearing to be developed as as a two independent input devices? So, in other words, you're hearing two different things and you're processing two different continuous inputs. I think you always do that. Uh, so I have an interest as an educator in multitasking, because if you teach at Stanford now, you'll see that the undergraduates and the graduate students in any given class have their computers open all the time. And the question is, are they genuinely multitasking, listening to the, what's going on, or are they scanning rapidly back and forth between attention modes? I think it's the latter. I don't think genuine multitasking in attention, let alone in a specific sense, is really there. I mean, you can actually measure certain very simplistic notions is how can you discriminate two things in time in very short increments? And actually, in a sense, the pathologic ear actually better discriminates them, the healthier better integrates them over time, interestingly enough. But I think, you know, the whole issue of multitasking uh, is extraordinarily important to learning and how we live life today as your world has really changed what we all do. And I think the challenge we have as educators is that the multitasking done by our learners is relevant to the content. So that we create for them a sort of Twitter feed that they can make about what the lecture is on. That we give them the opportunity to be reading literature about what it is and, and going back and forth and looking at an enriched learning environment as opposed to being on Facebook, forgive me if any of you talk. You're too old for Facebook, I guess. <laughs> you know, so it, it is really interesting and there's more and more scholarship being done about the ability to multitask and I think it's, it's a very rapid scanning rather than a true simultaneity in most cases. You know, looking at, assuming you start coming up with these cures, how do you deal with the ethical issues in doing the human protocols to actually try these out? Because you have somebody who has partial hearing loss, they still have hearing. And now you're taking a higher risk that they may have no hearing at all. 
Well, I think the answer to that is very analogous to the way cancer innovations come in. They're tried out first in people that have no other options, people who are, in fact, deaf, and that have little to risk in terms of the function within their inner ear. And then as you have proof of concept, you then move into people who have less and less to lose until it becomes so safe, and it would have to be very safe. There's no question that the whole concept of just taking an embryonic stem cell and throwing it into a system, you know, that's not likely to work. Um, but these guys have come an enormous distance. I mean, we have, I haven't said it quite this way, but this guy's world famous for having developed stem, and identified stem cells within the mammalian inner ear and developed progenitor cells and figured out the biology to mature them into hair cells that actually function. I mean, if you asked somebody 10 years ago, that would have been impossible. So someone like me, I may be more optimistic because I'm clinical as opposed to a careful scientist. But I'll tell you, from where we are today, so many things have happened in the last 10 years we never thought was possible. And then looking at where things are evolving, I'm really very hopeful this will come out. But it will first come out, as in the terminal cancer patient, the utterly deaf person, and then move down. But we have to be very careful when you start proliferating cells, or you start inhibiting cell cycle inhibitors themselves, or you start putting in rapidly preliminating uh, Rap rapidly proliferating primitive cells. That sounds like cancer, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you have to figure that out. First of all, the safety issues become very paramount in this. And hence, a lot of things look at epigenetic and protein or look at chemicals that can modulate the genes as opposed to throwing in engineered cells. And, and I'm no expert, and these guys know far more than I do about those things. But that's why there are going to be a number of different avenues uh, that will lead to success. There's another. <coughs> Briefly, say you something about the oh. Grim Reaper of the evening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's about the end. Did you have one other thought you wanted to say? In there? Well, one, one quick yeah. thought is also um, the, the, the largest market for any kind of drug is actually the aging market. And then, how do you design a clinical trial for the aging population? How do you prove that um, hearing gets improved? So, so, this is a really difficult situation and issue to solve. When you when you bring it to this market, so I think the first the first patients we are going to treat will be utterly deaf. This is very clearly the way we are we are we are heading. I'll just make the point though that when someone has lost the hair cell population in a patch of the cochlea, no matter how well you make the device, it can only do as well as the ear can actually hear. It can be the most elegant, most wonderful high fidelity device. But that's why there's a need, and, and there are there is one other strategy for people, for example, with aging who've lost the high notes, the notes on the right side of the piano. And that is to stimulate acoustically in the area of partial loss and electrically in the part of the cochlea that's high frequency. So a hybrid of a cochlear implant type strategy together with a classic acoustical hearing aid strategy. And these are now starting to uh, really develop. We can continue outside. Yeah. This is uh, one of those evenings where we old investment bankers have to admit that there are perhaps occupations in life more critical than estimating quarterly earnings per share. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we at ACG and in this valley have to recognize that uh, Stanford came first. Stanford is probably a reason that this valley exists. Uh, and these gentlemen are pretty worthy represent representatives of the cutting edge of things that some of us will have difficulty understanding, but I think we all regard ourselves as very privileged to have had a little bit of your time tonight, and Jeff, thank you for forming this group. Thank you very much. Sure.